Senate Thank you. President Craig Blair is with us via telephone from the Capitol. Craig, good morning to you. Good morning. Before we get started, I'd just like to tell you, I think Alonzo is there for the zucchini bread. <laughs> <laughs> you caught me, Craig. You caught me. <laughs> he had some. It was pretty good. I got to tell you, it was pretty good. I have good. not, because zucchini can, you know, do you not, some you don't do damage zucchini? with your teeth when you're sort of on camera. So I decided to Oh, you afraid to get to something stuck it. in your teeth? Yeah, you, and nobody will tell you. You know, you're looking at yourself going, ooh, what, piece what's of, that green thing? Piece of spinach, right? <laughs> yeah, no, piece of no spinach. No spinach salad during the show? Yeah. Exactly. All right, so we'll be, I'll be doing the show tight lipped this morning. That's right, like this, except me. I'm good. You're all right. You're clean. Uh, Craig, how often do you get back to Berkeley County, by the way? <laughs> Just debate every week. Uh, this weekend, I won't be able to get back. Uh, there's things going on down here that I have to be here for the weekend. But I drive back on Friday afternoons anywhere from 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Then I get home. Just in time to take out the garbage, mow the grass, uh, help the wife do some things, great dinner and everything. And then on Sunday afternoon, anywhere from Sunday at noon to 4 o'clock, I drive back to Charleston. And then we repeat over and over and over. To, uh, there's a lot of work that gets done. Uh, this, this is how you end up with the special session. And this was a historic special session as far as I'm concerned. And many people uh, believe that because we got work done for the people. Craig, in your position, I would think the least we could do is have a private jet for you flying you back and forth. Stubblefield Airlines. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope, I disagree. And here's the reason for it. Uh, even when I'm driving, uh, Sunday's not so much so. Sunday's a more of a thinking day and to sort of planning. I keep a clipboard uh, on my desk right now. If I sent you a picture, there's like 35 clipboards with different things that are going on, whether it's economic, whether it's legislation, whatever it may be. Uh, but when I'm driving back on Fridays, uh, that, that's uh, on the speakerphone, and I'm talking to people uh, all the time on trying to coordinate things and hearing what's going on, trying to mesh things together, spend a lot of time on the phone uh, with the speaker and uh, the finance chair and uh, also the governor's office, Brian Abraham, uh, Ann, Ann Erling, Chelsea Ruby, uh, the, 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 Jimmy Reston, Department of Highways. Uh, we all worked uh, together. And, uh, uh, hey, I left out Mitch Carmichael, Economic Development, James Bailey, Commerce. Uh, it, if you don't talk to each other, you don't get things done. And I'm a big believer in that, and I'm sort of the hub for making sure that things move forward. How much time did you spend with the governor in advance of the special session that he called Craig to go over the 45 bills that were on there? Um, probably less than two minutes. <laughs> of that, and you said the governor. Now, when it comes to the governor's office, Brian and Ann and of uh, the sec cabinet secretaries uh, of, for instance, Jeff Sandy of uh, is now he's since retired, but he was involved in the process. For I'll use an example of corrections. When we were finished of uh, the regular general session. Of what it was is like, okay, we realized, I realized that there were still issues that had to be dealt with when it comes to corrections. So we gave it about three weeks to get everybody settled down. And then we started bringing in to the president's conference room, the speaker and I working together with the governor's office. And we went through and took a deep dive into what we could get done, what we could actually have a four-fifths vote suspension and be able to get things done to solve corrections long term. And did we get everything done? No, because nothing's ever done. Uh, but we we made huge steps uh, into the process on making it so that corrections is right. Keeping in mind, back in 2019, I believe it was, uh, that we uh, gave $10,000 a year pay raises to all the corrections workers. And that had a stabilizing effect 
but it didn't really solve the problem and it exposed itself then during COVID again. So this time we took a much deeper dive and I'm assuming that you guys wanted to talk about that this morning. Yes, I, I do want to ask you one more general question before we get into some of the specifics. And that is that I talked to Senator Jason Barrett and he said that the Senate had plenty of time to go over the bills. They knew what was going on in advance. They were prepared for the meetings and it was not a hurried uh, experience. When I talked to members of the House, it's the direct opposite. They didn't get a chance to see the bills or read much of them in advance. Uh, some of them were driving to Charleston before they found out what time they were supposed to be in session. And in some cases, they were running in after parking their cars. Any idea why the difference between what the Senate seemed to be prepared for in advance versus the House? And so if this is sort of like... I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't when it comes to this, because I need to be able to work with the House. The Senate, the House, and the executive need to be able to work together. On my end of the building, and that is what I, as Senate President, and the staff that we have here are excellent. And what it is is communications, everything. And so I had Zoom meetings uh, with the members, letting them know what's going on. I t again, that's that drive that I was talking about, each direction. I talk to members, call them up, they call me, they know that I'm driving. Uh, and then we go over things that's going on. This special session, I also t put together a booklet. And the booklet had everything that was going to be in the special session. And it was to, to one of the House members, because I, I, I told the speaker, I said, I'm printing out an extra hundred of them. Maybe this will help you out on your side of the building. He goes, oh, I'd love that. And somebody made the comment that it was still hot off the press. And it was. Uh, and the reason for it was is it was printed up. We had I had a House member come and wanted to have something added to the call. Uh, and it was afternoon on Sunday, but it was a good idea, and we believed that it would be able to be to be able to get done passed through both chambers, which it was. And so called down to the governor's office, said, "Hey, when I add something else to the call, can you do it?" And of course, they're trying to work with this as well. So when it comes to the Senate side, we caucus a lot. Uh, I put as much information out there as I possibly can. I am as about as transparent with the members as you can possibly get on it because you can't make good decisions on bad information. So I try to tell the whole story, Tom. And if I can't tell the whole story, I've got somebody that can. And Jason Barrett, for instance, was involved in corrections. Of uh, He's on the committee for uh, jails and all. And got him in, got him involved on the different things that was going on. All right, very good. I hope that answered your question. It, it did. I, I know. I know you got to be careful what you say because you got to work with people. I understand. Uh, but I can yeah, read between and, the lines. And, and I can't second guess of what how the house operates and what the speaker does and all that. That that's inappropriate from my side. I spent eight years in the house delegates. Of, and I understand the process that's over there, and but it's hard to, to, to again, in, in my caucus on Sunday afternoon, of, I, I, there's a president's conference room. And actually, I had a wall knocked out down here so that it was bigger, so that everybody could sit in that room, hear each other, discuss what's going on, answer the questions, and, and move forward. It's much, much harder to do that when you have 100 members of, on there. Now, I don't believe that there was any House member that did not know that there was not going to be a special session. It was public knowledge out there. That Now, what was on the call, a lot of people had an understanding, but there was a lot more on it. Why? Because we're trying to operate our state at the speed of business, not the speed of government. And sometimes things can't wait. And the House chambers is going to be under construction. They're remodeling the whole place, bringing it up. It hasn't been done for decades and decades. And there's no chance for a special session to take place over there or a second one in September, October, November. And uh, real quick clarification before I go to Bill. It wasn't that they didn't know there was going to be a special session. It was that they didn't know what time they were supposed to be actually gaveling in. 
Okay, well, that's not uncommon. And in fact, I believe the special session was called for four o'clock. And I want you to know, I promise I didn't mute anybody. <laughs> Craig, where are you? I think Roger Hanshaw just cut off Craig. <laughs> All right, Craig will try to call us back. In the meantime, Bill, why don't you start your question now by the time Craig he'll calls back. Right. He'll be ready to go. <laughs> that, that was not a kind thing to say, right? <laughs> yeah, just kidding. You, well, you know, beforehand, we you were joking before we went on the air that it was going to be a rough day for you. With me. <laughs> With you. <laughs> With me. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to text Craig uh, in the meantime that he got caught up. He I'm might not still sure be he, talking. He, he, he might not know. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. He may not know that he got... Uh, he got cut off. So in the, uh, where are we, about 819? Uh, it's still but a little bit too early to take our, but our break. But we have in. Alonzo here. He can fill in. Yeah, this is also <laughs> true. Alonzo, by the way, this is an excellent opportunity to plug the September event you've got coming up when we get Craig back on the phone. So if you guys haven't seen yet, uh, the Berkeley County Republican Club is actually going to be having the Eisenhower Dinner at Heritage Hall in Inwood. Uh, times are 5 to 9. And we're going to have some nationally recognized speakers there. We're going to have uh, Jack Posobiec, Alex Stein, and Ashley St. Clair. Um, they're from, you know, human events, from uh, the Blaze and the Babylon Bee. We're going to have some national media there. Uh, DC News Now is going to be uh, there to kind of film the event. And we're also going to be doing a presidential straw poll for everyone. So uh, we'll get to see where everyone's at on the actual 2024 a Republican nomination, so our primary uh, electorate. How do you get tickets? So you can go to berkeleycountygop.com. That's berkeleycountygop.com to buy your tickets. We have a reduced price for couples, and um, I think it's about $70 per ticket uh, for the event. And it's going to be a great night. I mean, I'm just super excited. I think that we've made strides to kind of modernize uh, the Berkeley County Republicans and also just, you know, bring uh, uh, forth an event that's hopefully going to be you know some the talk of the town for holiday uh, in the venue Alonzo? no so it's not at the holiday Inn. we're going to do it at heritage hall okay um, in 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 wood mm -hmm. in wood okay mm -hmm. yeah senate now, president blair has uh, rejoined our group here craig good morning <laughs> once again you got cut off there somehow i don't understand that it must have been on your end because i'm on a landline here <laughs> yeah I, I think it was roger hanshaw he's afraid what you're going to say next boom <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Hey, let's uh, let's go to the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Bill. Yeah, uh, Craig. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm sure you go, you'll go. You'll discuss in some detail what you did in the interim special session. But let me use that as kind of a springboard. Uh, what did you do in the special interim session to prepare you or in preparation for your next regular session in January? What? Ask that question yeah, yeah. Uh, Where there was, did you do? Were there certain actions taken in preparation or with the intent of setting the stage for your January session? No, there wasn't. Uh, I'd say, of course, the bills that we were addressing could have impact into January, uh, but January would be a different game. And to be quite honest with you, we're sending out text and letters and emails telling people to get in their legislation, their proposed ideas now. That is what has already started so that in the months of September, October, November, December, that we can actually come into the general session and a, with an understanding of the things that we need to do and how we're going to go about handling our budgetary requirements uh, from that standpoint. But everybody's got bills that are that are interest to them and, and that are good for their communities that can actually move their, uh, our, our state forward. And so we've already begun that process. I actually have uh, a whiteboard outside my office when somebody says that there's a good idea or that, that we ought to do this or we ought to do that. Everything goes on that whiteboard, and that list starts building on that. And then, but then there's an electronic version of that too on things that we know that we need to do and that we need to address. So. It's, it's a non – if you want to have a government that is effective and that is not gridlock, 
you know where I'm where I'm pointing my fingers at now. Of uh, you got to be on the game all the time and, and working and communicating with each other and trying to do the best you can to being able to get things and then compromising. If you don't always get what you want of on this, but you find that compromise uh, win-win scenarios if possible move forward. Yeah, uh, kind of following, we've heard a lot about the uh, success you had in a uh, special interim section, session on corrections and volunteer fire department. Were there other things of note that we have not heard as much about? Well, yes. Uh, we moved $45 million over to Marshall University, and if your listeners didn't know, it, we had uh, what's it called, uh, a, a hack of in Berkeley County's uh, Board of Education of uh, this past year ransom uh, on it and shut the things down. We've got to do better at cybersecurity, and if you, you can't do better at it unless you actually have people that know what's going on. Brad Smith, former CEO of Intuit, that's QuickBooks if you don't know who Intuit is, of, is now the president of Marshall University. And he's so well connected in that industry, the Silicon Valley industry, for lack of a better term. And he wants to uh, raise up a program at Marshall University. WVU actually has one also. But to be the premier cybersecurity uh, education system in the country, and he can do that with that $45 million, and that's an investment of into the future for Marshall. We uh, moved to $50 million last year into the 73rd um, Cancer Center for WVU. Of And so it's a balancing act, too, making sure that we can do it. But uh, both Gordon Gee and Brad Smith has been out here working with us. And, and you guys have talked about it on the show where to, we've been to Seattle. We've been to uh, Northern California. We've been to Denver, the, the New York City, Washington, D.C., and there's more. And there's more to come where we go out and we meet with corporate America. And, the, and I said this, I think, the last time I was on the show. So the thing that has changed is we're no longer selling West Virginia. They're coming to us. They're coming to us wanting to know how they can invest in West Virginia. And, again, it comes back to good fiscal management, moving at the speed of business, and then being able to adapt into the 21st century, being nimble to be able to get these things done. And it's exciting. It's exactly why I got into government. 20 years ago, uh, to be able to make these differences. Now, I never dreamed for a minute that I could be at the helm and, and be going around with some of the best and brightest people in the world, and, and uh, maybe that's an exaggeration, but in the state. But Gordon Gee and Brad Smith, I can tell you right now, wherever we go, there are people that know them, and, and they open doors up for opportunity for the people of West Virginia. Maria Lawrence. Good morning, Craig. So you um, you just opened the door about post-secondary education, and of course there have been stories that have come out um, within the past week um, about WVU having to cut programs. I think it's 32 programs, 130 something faculty members, um, you know, and you just made reference to you know to monies that. Um, recently went to Marshall. Um, is it time for a more um, concentrated look at post-secondary education and and right sizing even more? Um, we know that um, you know that that people are looking at trade schools and other opportunities post-secondary ed nowadays. And West Virginia, of course, does not have a very high. Um, rate of college attendance. So talk a little bit about what your thoughts are in terms of um, uh, post-secondary ed and, and how to right-size that. 
Okay, well, we've done a lot of work already, to, uh, and I'm a big guy for on the to associate degrees and certifications, and that is where things are gravitating to in this country to start with. When I was with Amazon Web Services of the, the, of in Seattle here, what was it, a month and a half ago, two months ago, certifications is a big deal. Uh, it's a specialized education uh, for, from that standpoint. So education in general in this country uh, is changing, and it's not just in West Virginia. It's everywhere. Uh, and so our institutions need to self-reflect and, and say to themselves, look, we've got declining student enrollment. Uh, students are saying, look, why should I go to school for and have a hundred thousand dollars in student debt or more and then come out and be working for less money than what somebody that went and learned a trade be a plumber or electrician that doesn't make economic sense uh for, from that standpoint for the students so i did, i, I got to go back to brad smith because he's got a long-term plan in marshall university where he's going to increase his student population but he's going to make it so that when you graduate from marshall university you're going to graduate with no student debt and a job a job opportunity that is how you go back and you rethink where you're at gordon gee's a thinker too and uh, that, yes, there's some things that are on the chopping block at this point in time, and that's the process that they need to go through. But I think they're like five, down 5,000 students, and COVID didn't help anything. Okay, when when there there was already a, a small decline, but it has made us as a society relook, reexamine how we go about doing things, and so. I'm, I'm not in favor at this point in time at throwing money, nor is Gordon Gee asking for money to come to West Virginia University. What he's doing is using this as an opportunity, and their board of governors, you know, that he works for them, uh, to be able to go in and look at what they can do and to make it so that it's a 21st century education rather than a 20th century education. Alonzo Perry. Hey, how's it going, Senate President? Uh, Good so, morning. So I, I know you kind of wanted to talk about corrections, or I think you uh, understand that you know corrections are going to be brought up. So I guess my question is, what is kind of the impetus of uh, the corrections bills that were presented? And then uh, could you elaborate on, like, what was the corrective action that you were trying to take? Uh, was it purely cor or retention, or was it something else? Uh, oh, it was all the above. And, and then still more to go. Remember that you, um, when you go in and do something, uh, first of all, you want to make sure that what you've done is working. And if it's not, then adapt. Uh, but the, the first thing, and, and this will take up a good bit of time, uh, but when we started having these meetings, corrections come in and uh, sat with the speaker, the governor's office. There was a whole room full. I uh, had people from the courts, the judicial system. Uh, at, at point in time, uh, we had the sheriff in from um, Cabell County. We had people in from Berkeley County uh, because it's not just about uh, giving pay raises. It's about learning how we can do this process better and, and manage it better. So. The uh, corrections folks come in, and they basically wanted to cross the board $10,000 pay raise again, like that was done in 2019. And for lack of a better term, I'm like, nope. Uh, we got to look at this hard. We got to take a holistic approach and, and look at everything that's going on and be able to deal with this. And they were very, very conducive to working with us. It's one of the things that I've been saying about the agencies uh, in the state. They're catching on. Uh, they're starting to realize that we can work together to be able to get things done. So I got to asking some uh, questions, and the first one was done without any legislation at all. And it was like, how many new people do you hire a year? And this is of corrections officers one this is where you enter into the system they said about 600 is the new ones and 
over the course of the year, half of them quit before the end of the year was up. Now, it cost, I think, $16,800 to send them to the State Police Academy to go through training. So before these people ever even walked into a prison environment or a regional jail, they were hired and they were sent to the academy for training. They never shot at anybody to see what the job was like or anything like that. And it takes a special type of person to be able to do that job. To a greater degree, that's where those three, the 300 got to on the job after going through all that and said, this isn't for me. Probably every one of you as a host have taken a job somewhere along the line and said after a week or so or two weeks, this isn't for me. I made a mistake. I, I chose the wrong thing. Yeah, don't get me and started, I, Craig. Okay. <laughs> yeah, long you're still time there, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, but what, what I'm boiling this down to is, is it's $4.8 million a year that was coming out of the corrections budget. And if we're able to save $2 million a year, that's money that can be applied to wages. This is the shadowing is already taking place, and and that was a, a quick operation. Now, I'm going to throw my wife underneath the bus a little bit because I got to talking to her about it. And uh, when when we were starting to figure out these numbers, there's not a shortage of there's job classification: CO1, CO2, CO3, four, five, six, seven. I think it goes up to eight. And uh, and their rankings too, just like a corporal, a lieutenant, a captain, and all that. And I didn't put those in order. I just named them off there. What happens is is that for a pay raise to take place for somebody, if you're a CO one, you move up into the CO two position. I believe it's after sixty days, something like that. They're not sixty days, six months. It may be a year. I've done forgotten what that is, so I'm not an expert when it comes to that. But then when you go from CO1 to CO2 and you want another pay raise, then you got to go from two to three. Now, when you get to three, that's where you're doing the hands-on work of dealing with the inmates and all. Well, some people are really great at that. That's like some people are great at being teachers and terrible at being administrators. When you get up into the CO4s, 5s, 6s, 7s, 8s, that's where you get into the more of the administration level. My wife works for the Maryland Corrections. Explains a lot of things why she's married to me, by the way. But that was a laugh line. Are you all on here? We're no. laughing. We're laughing. I, I We're had just the mics, not laughing out loud. I had the mics down. That yeah. was on me. We, we got a good <laughs> chuckle. Out of I thought I got cut off again. I'm sitting here talking no. to myself. <laughs> You're fine. But, uh, so uh, I said something to my wife about that because she never wants to be in administration. She loves working with the clients, uh, and that's what they call them in Maryland. And um, so I got to thinking about it, and I was like, is there a step process to where you can still get pay raises and still remain a CO3 of uh, class one, class two? And if you want to work 20 years as a CO3 but still get pay raises, that we can have that in place. That was not in place. That in turn made it so that if you wanted to pay raise, you only had two ways to be able to get it in the state of West Virginia. The cross the board pay raises, which we've done four of in the last four years, I believe it is, or you had to move up in your rank. And there's, again, I know there's many people that would prefer to do that hands-on work. And so we put steps in place, and uh, it's not the greatest number. It was either 250 or 350 where you got the pay raise uh, for being able to do that. But it's a step in the right direction on being able to manage that. Now, I've gotten a lot of emails from people that are not CEOs, but they work as psychologists or cafeteria workers or, you know, things like that. Uh, and sometimes they go up and actually do the CO work. They get paid CO's pay rates when they're in the job doing those rates. And we did do one time of 
bonus and actually it got amended to where then there was two bonuses on that and I, I don't want to say what that bonus was it was significant uh it seems like it was five thousand dollars but i can't remember that got amended and i've got a bunch of paperwork in front of me and for me to look that up it'll destroy that doesn't make for good radio for you were those the two twenty six hundred dollar bonuses that are about six months apart craig is that what you're referring yeah, to that's it thank you rob you're welcome uh, that, that we go through so many gyrations of stuff that the numbers can blend together in your head, and this is the, and that was the negotiation with the House of Delegates. They wanted to do it that way, and I'm like, I, I can remember I slammed my hand down on the desk and I said, I think that's a good idea. Let's do it. Uh, and uh, in the governor's office is on board, and that's that that change took place. We moved on. So that's a couple things. Now, there are other things that we did with the Department of Corrections also where, like, for instance, uh, okay. temporary identification cards when inmates get released so that we're doing everything that we can to get them back into the workforce as quickly as we possibly can. So that cuts down on the recidivism rate so that we're not paying for them to be in prison again. Mm hmm now, you jump, Rob, you wanted to ask something. Yeah, I was say, did. Can you hold on a moment? We, we're a little late for our half-hour break here, so sure. hang on. We'll be right back with more with the Senate President, Craig Blair. And, yeah. uh, in the meantime, we are joined in studio by the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, Maria Lawrence, and Alonzo Perry, and via telephone, Senate President, Craig Blair. Craig, I want to ask you if we could move on to the July revenue numbers. One second. Yes. Let me hit on three things that on corrections – before we get away from that. Yeah, please, please do, yes. Uh, the first one is is that uh, we also, uh, the, the municipalities uh, to reimburse, uh, be responsible for county jail bill in certain cases. That has been a huge problem where municipalities throughout the state has been pushing out of like a DUI case and sending it to a magistrate court instead of their own court. And then it in turn ends up costing the counties. It's a cost shift that has been taking place. We've addressed that. Uh, another one is, is the Supreme Court to develop pretrial release programs in all the circuits. That is a big deal also because it helps manage the inmate population or, or to give them alternative. And this is something that was suggested by the courts to be able to work with that. And here's the last one. And this one sort of come in of late of when, in, the, in the meeting process. But we got told there was 40 inmates of, that, that are out there that want to, uh, to have sex change. That's right, by a million bucks a crack. It's elective surgery. A million? That would have been a $40 million cost to the taxpayers of the state of West Virginia. And so my counsel now said that, well, if we get ready and do the sex change when we're going to be in the national news, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and, and that's all fine as well, but it might have been some crazy amendments taking place to go along with it too. And But – we got ready and made it so that we defined the word medical procedure and medically necessary. And so now that it basically is making it so that elective medical procedures in the state of West Virginia cannot happen, that will save the taxpayers a tremendous amount of money when it comes to the people that are incarcerated in both our, well, mainly our prisons uh, from that standpoint. So, and, and I'm, I'll be the first one to tell you that uh, sex change operation is an elective procedure. Okay, I, I, I'm not buying for a minute. It's not. It's medically necessary, and it's certain. It's been. This is. I don't know this to be fact, but I've been told by the authorities. Most of them are in there for um, sexually related crimes to begin with, and uh, so there's no reason for us to spend. 30 or $40 million for for that. If that needs to be done, then they can do that outside of with their own dollar. Alonzo just said that uh, at a million bucks a pop, he's not going to go to law school now. He's going to become a surgeon <laughs> specializing in sex change operations. I think it's a smart economic play there, Alonzo. Yeah. Uh, uh, Craig, Craig, your third reason is, is just begs for follow-up questions. But let me go to your first one about the pushing some of the costs back to the uh, municipalities. There was a cutoff. Oh. About it, don't you? 
I'm sorry. Uh, there's a cutoff at 4,000 that defines the municipality, uh, and I believe that uh, um, uh, Martinsburg is not 4,000. Uh, what is the reason for having the criteria of 4,000? Well, no, no, no. Martinsburg is definitely included uh, in this. You're going on the wrong side of 4,000 uh, on that. Martinsburg will definitely uh, be in this. What's the population of Martinsburg then, Craig? Beats me. It's bigger than 4,000. Yeah. It's bigger than yeah, 4,000. Like, I, I, I may be all. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, Craig. Excuse me. You're exactly right. I got my numbers wrong. So sorry about that. I thought Mars were like 18,000. <laughs> yeah, it is 18. It is, I was thinking six. Now I was saying 1,600. You're exactly right. So my, my Bill, mistake. you just about gave me a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, I know. You gave me a heart attack as well when you said it's qualified. So, yeah, that was. Uh, I get a check mark for being a mistake on that one. Let me go another question on that. Uh, now you got your one and you messed it up. Then, so. I, I did mess it up. It's because I'll I let him go. It, He's going to go anyway. So, so I, have a, I have one in your place. Uh, you mentioned retention uh, with the uh, correction officers. Uh, Larry Kump was on earlier. He mentioned there was no psychological exams uh, given to the correctional applicants, uh, applicants for correction officers. That would go a long way in determine how suitable a particular candidate was uh why are we not giving psychological exams for applicants for corrections in all due respect that doesn't take legislation to be able to do that and uh, that, that is being uh, addressed uh, is my understanding within corrections and the administration on that so it doesn't you, you not everything has to be done with legislation points well so, taken thank you okay okay yep now I wanted to I wanted to ask the question about the July revenue numbers if we could Craig are you uh, prepared sure. to talk about those? Yes. Okay, very good. Hey, uh, we had on uh, Seth De Stefano uh, from the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy yesterday, and he talked about his concerns over a trend that is pushing surpluses lower to the point where he thinks it's approaching crisis mode. Can you talk about the July revenue numbers? I've heard two different takes on those. One. Those numbers are trending lower, and, and those are fairly realistic. The other take I've heard is really was a timing thing as, as to when payments are made. The surplus for July was not really as low and will be reflected in better August numbers. First of all, the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy is nothing but a Democrat think tank, okay? And I'd take them to Las Vegas any day, and if they told me to bet black, I'd bet red, and I'd walk away a millionaire, okay? And so let's not – I'm not going to pull any punches there. The only thing they did right that I've noticed is named it so it sounds like it's a government agency and that people believe what they're saying. Uh, the fact of the matter is there are no trends uh, – well, there is one – the month of July was down, just like every other month of July of when we go to dealing with the budget. What happens is is that the revenue, look, for instance, like severance tax, the money comes out of there to be dispersed to the counties in, in that month period. And so then that's why the numbers are down. Now, is the economy contracting a little bit? Maybe so. Uh, and inflation is slowing down also. And that was what was helping push our numbers up. I am not the least bit concerned uh, about where we're at because we've got more things coming on uh, in the state of West Virginia. They're right now. There are 4,500 workers out here putting in the Mountain Valley Pipeline. They're on the job. They're actually paying, they're, they're, they're create, using sales tax, creating wages and all that. That is all taking place. And then you've got all this construction going on for these new businesses coming in. You can see the construction taking place, and it trickles out into the housing and all that. So that gives it, and there's less than uh, 9,000 people that's drawing unemployment, and I could actually be too high on that number so when you take people and you get them off the rolls and you get them into being taxpayers instead of tax takers it's hard for those revenue numbers to be able to be going south of on that so i don't buy that now what it is is with that group though they want you to throw all the money that you've got we would have not been able to give any tax relief to the people of west virginia or the businesses of west virginia if they had their way about it okay their way of doing it is to spend every freaking nickel that you got of into feel-good projects and hoping for the best 
And I'm sorry that I'm, I get a little bit angry about this one and all because we've, had, we've got a track record, a uh, history of right now, and, uh, since I was the finance chairman, moving forward of t- turning our state around, having to, uh, revenues to be able to take and target uh, to where you can actually invest in yourselves and get a greater return for the taxpayer, thus setting the stage to be able to reduce taxes further. I would like to thank you for your use of self-editing with the word fricking there, <laughs> yeah. by the way, Craig. Oh, I'm sorry. And we were Joe waiting Dennis. on you, Craig. No, the, it was, you were just, you were priming for fr- the... Fricking is okay. You're yeah. all right yeah, with that. That's why I thanked you for the self-editing. Maria. Um, so on, on that note, then, I heard um, WVEA president, Mr. Lee, speak about... Um, you know, the, the teacher shortage and, you know, we're getting ready to start another school year. And Seth often brings up the whole teacher pay raise issue. Um, is that something, again, looking forward to the coming um, session uh, in, the, in the spring, winter, spring, um, is that sort of out there at all, Craig, um, in terms of looking at a, at a public employee pay raise for this coming Uh, session? The the answer to a greater degree is yes. And you can look at our history. Again, since I became the finance chairman, there's been four across-the-board pay raises. Uh, This last one wasn't as great. Uh, It was $2,300 uh, pay raise. And keep in mind that the teachers do have step increases, uh, and and there are ways that that they continuously uh, get more money. But we do these across-the-board or pay raises to be able to keep up with things. But then we also did a 21.25% tax reduction. That's money in your back pocket. And then we've triggered or going to trigger another 10%. So it's going to be a 31.25% tax reduction on your personal income tax. And then that's a great segue, Maria, uh, because let's not forget that the personal property tax on your uh, vehicles Uh, the automobiles and all that, and that was a bill that we did also, and I think I was on this show and talked about it. I know it's on Hoppy. We ran a bill to clear up uh, a little bit of the language on that so that if you've paid, you already paid your personal property tax, or you, as long as you pay it on time, you'll be able to claim half of it in your income tax next year in 2024 and then all of it in 2025 never never should we ever penalize a taxpayer for doing the right things and paying their taxes in fact we should make it so that we lower their taxes and make it so it's easier to pay those taxes. And that's another whole story that I'd love to get into on making West Virginia the first digital state in the union, making it so that you can actually use your phone to be able to pay your personal property tax or, or whatever it may be. i got to have one more thing on to that, too, because my wife said to me the other day, our personal property tax is up this year. And your listeners are probably all thinking the same thing. Here's what happened. There was a state of emergency, and the governor, through executive order, held the prices on, during COVID, held the prices on or the, the, what you could be charged. Assessments. On your personal property tax. Okay, and now that's been lifted because uh-huh. that's gone, and then your cars are, are way more valuable than what they used to be because of the supply chain issues and all that. Ever you did, go look them up on the NADA, but then there's one other thing, and I said that this was going to happen. The counties are going to go for about as much as they possibly can because they know that you're going to get reimbursed for it. And uh, because the state's going to reimburse you for it, so this is an infusion of dollars into the counties also. Now, maybe not all counties are doing that. I have no idea. But I'm a good predictor of human behavior. And I can tell you that if you're going to get reimbursed, it's a pass-through. And anybody saying, well, why are we doing it this way? Well, the folks in Berkeley County voted for Amendment 2, but the state did not. And so this is the workaround to be able to get the money back in your pocket. Final question, Alonzo Perry. 
I guess I just want to ask you if you're coming to the Eisenhower dinner on <laughs> September 16th. Not only am I coming to the Eisenhower dinner, I intend to sponsor uh, the Berkeley County uh, Republican Executive Committee's reception that they have beforehand, uh, to, to, and so I'm excited about it. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's going to be nice to have you there. Wow. Oh, you weren't expecting that, were you, Alonzo? No, no. I think this is awesome. Yeah. Nice what'd, you, what, what'd, you, what'd you expect me to say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not coming. Alon I'm not paying. Can Alonzo put you down for 500 bucks on the 50-50 right now, Craig? Uh, hey, I always play the 50-50s. What it is is everybody looks at me really mean when I win. Uh, <laughs> but you don't turn it back, Craig? That's the that's the proper thing to do, right? You, you donate okay, it back. No, I didn't, I didn't tell the rest of the story. When I do turn it back and I do all the time, my wife is looking at me. Why do you do that? Why do you do that? You won. <laughs> so, but no, no, I'm excited about it. I look forward to seeing everybody. And uh, and, and your, for your listeners, great things are happening in the state of West Virginia. Never has there been a prouder moment to be able to be in West Virginia and, and, and live here, work here, and raise a family. It's getting better, and we've been digging out of these legacy issues of the past, and we're getting there. And I'm so proud of it, and I'm so proud of the people. So, Craig, thanks, thank so, you. thanks so much for your time this morning. We appreciate the hour. You're welcome.